Father, uh, we give you glory. We thank you, Lord, for the time that we have today. We pray, God, for your spirit to be here and among us as we are gathered together in your name with intention and with purpose. I pray, God, that our hearts are open to the things that you have to, to share with us, that you'll speak uh, your word and your truth as we dive into the word of God tonight. Uh, we thank you for all that you're doing. And, and uh, Lord, I, I pray over uh, this congregation. I pray for those that are present here tonight. Uh, for us to be able to enter into the, the gates of maturity uh, together, to be an encouragement one to another, to walk alongside one another, some ahead, some behind, but working together uh, for a, a spirit of, of excellence, a spirit of, of um, growth, a spirit of truth, uh, truth, truth, that your truth rises, that your truth is what is set before us. So, uh, we look ahead to you, Lord God. We depend on you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Sunday, the message was uh, on, on fading prosperity. And um, really, what we're, we, we looked at the, the scripture in 3 John, you know, where uh, John is writing to Gaius. And he says, my beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health. Uh, even as your soul prospers, even as your, your soul prospers. As um, I've been meditating on, on the thought, the idea, the intention of what the Apostle John is saying to Gaius in this time, you, know, you can look through a, a lot of the commentaries and, and there's a lot of um, conjecture or speculation that uh, Gaius was sick. And that's why he wrote it this way. But I believe it's a spiritual principle that is uh, being released here, that there's a lot of things that happen in the soul and that the things that are happening in the soul, are, 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 they, they play out in the natural world. So on Sunday, I, I kind of started off talking about the three-part being. Anybody know what the three parts of the being are? Yeah, body, soul, spirit, or you could say spirit body, soul, <laughs> but to realize that you are a three-part being and to be able to recognize who's functioning at what time. Yeah, I think that uh, if, if we can bring this into our worship time and recognize that when we are worshiping God, we're worshiping in song, we're worshiping in word, we're, we're worshiping uh, really from the heart, but to recognize, you know, that the true worshipers worship how? Spirit and truth. Why? Because God is spirit. And so, so that's where we have our God consciousness. So, you know, we, we say this a lot. It's, it's kind of like, you know, God is everywhere all the time. He's omnipresent. But there's times when his presence is, is more known or more manifest, more tangible. And, and that's because we are, are connecting in the spirit place in the spirit man and so we have a god consciousness at that time we have a spirit consciousness at that time and so that, that's where we're connecting in in the body we're just we're, we're assimilating uh, the world around us we have a consciousness of of the world around us we see it we smell it we touch it uh we we engage it um we, we can we can see it's it's warm or it's it's cold or, you know uh, it, it's humid it's dry I think when I was sharing it at the camp, something ran right up my leg. And I said, it, 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 that was an example of world consciousness. Something's running up my leg. I started to shake it off. And, and so just realizing that this is where, where, where these things are happening, and to realize that the soul is a very complex part of our being. It's our mind. It's our will. It's our emotions. It's our experiences. It's our memories. It's, uh, it's, it's our joys, our happiness. It's also the place of our, our sadness, a place uh, where we carry our scars. And that, that, that there's, there's something that's taking place there within the soul. And so what the Apostle John is saying as he's talking about the prosperity of the soul, regardless of what's going on in, in the other two realms, your soul needs to be growing. Your soul needs to be prospering. And when you have prosperity there, you'll see prosperity in other places. So if we can, if we can understand that, I may recognize, and that does not be that in every single case, but, but people are sick for different reasons. You know, sometimes people are sick because they don't eat right. They don't, 
They don't exercise. They're, they're hanging around sick people. There's viruses. There's bacteria. There's, there's things that can make us sick. But what happens when, you, when you're resolving all these natural things and yet you're not getting any better, have you considered what's going on in your soul? Or maybe you should consider that first, deal with that issue, and then start to look at all the externals that might still be uh, affecting you. Sometimes uh, we, can, we can feel spiritually dead or dry, and it's not really so much that you're spiritually dead or dry, that there's times you know, that you, you can be very active in the spirit, but you don't feel it. Right? You ever been there before? I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing, but I don't feel it. I can lay hands on the sick person, they'll get healed, but I don't feel it. It's not doing anything for me here. My soul is, is, is still not quite in the right place. And so we, we have to deal with the matters of the soul. So if, if we get that, we start to get this, we start to, to understand it. And this isn't a mind over matter kind of thing. This isn't, uh, this isn't some kind of a, a hyper-spiritual thing. This is our reality as believers, especially. I mean, if we're believers and, and, and we're spirit-filled, we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, then, then we need to be able to pay attention to the things of God, the things of the Word of God, and be able to put things into their, their right perspective. And if we do that, our prayer lives are going to change because you're not going to be praying about physical things when it's a soul issue. And I'll be phys- you're not going to be praying about uh, soul issues when it's really a physical issue. You're going to be more targeted. You're going to be more uh, on time, more on, on focus. Um, but uh, a few weeks ago, I don't remember which week it was, but uh, as I was closing the sermon, I was praying, and I got a vision, uh, a scary uh, type of a vision of a lot of people, real people, standing on the edge of a, 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 a cliff, a precipice, and they're about to fall away from faith. I can see it. And so I, remember, I don't know if any of y'all remember that. But we prayed, we prayed as a congregation for these people. Obviously, not by name, but, but we prayed for these people. And, and, uh, and I, I personally reached out to a number of them. And uh, some responded, some didn't respond. You know, some some weren't, weren't even concerned that I had a vision that they were in. Didn't even ask me about the vision. Weren't really concerned about the vision. It's kind of like, well, we'll see you in the fall kind of a thing. And you're like, well, you might be dry. You might, you might, you might uh, be, you might, your, your mind isn't right. Your emotions aren't right. Your will isn't in the right place. You've got a soul issue. And so we don't want to see people who got soul issues like that prosper because when they have that, they'll never come back to the things of God. They need to find a God reliance. They need to, to draw upon the Holy Spirit who's, who's calling them and following the Spirit gives them a, a, a direction and instruction. You know, he, he guides our steps. We're spirit-led, uh, not spirit-forced. So we begin to develop our, our, our uh, uh, consciousness of God and to deal with the issues of the soul. So from Sunday, <clears throat> the second point that I had, uh, I'll, I'll give you the points right quick. The first one was, you know, don't let your soul suffer for the sake of ambition. Right? And what, what good is it to win the whole world and still lose your soul? That's what Jesus said. And, there, and, and uh, I think we need to think about that a lot. I know that there's a lot of people. This is discipleship, so um, I'm going to go a little deeper than I would on a Sunday morning. But there's a lot of people that are chasing after soulish things. Um, you know, it, I'll get everything uh, right in the world, and then I'll go after the things of God. They're upside down. They're backwards. And I always shared the story before of a minister who had... Um, who had taught his children, a minister taught his children to first go out there, make all your money, do all the things here, and then you're free to do the things of God. It was an upside-down, backward approach to a relationship with God, to a fellowship with God, to being a Christian. You know, and so um, we need to make sure we're going after the right things. You know, how many times people have dropped away from uh, fellowship with the saints for the sake of of, uh, a better job? Uh, or uh, to, to try to get healthy here, try to, you know, do so many things that people pull away from the things of God to try to get fixed first, and then they go back and try to uh, justify things with God. But God don't play games with idols, just to put it on the table. That's an idol that gets set there. It's something else that was set before God. He doesn't, he doesn't mess around with that. If it is getting blessed, I don't know, that's between them and God, <laughs> and we're going to leave it right there. But... Um, 
Don't, don't, don't let your soul suffer for the sake of ambition. The second point was aligning with godliness brings peace and prosperity of character. And so, um, I'm sorry, that was number three. Anyways, number three was <laughs> aligning with godliness brings peace and prosperity of, of, of character. That when we get in that right place with, with God, that there's a, the, the God of peace. You, know, you, you look that up, you look up the exact phrase in the Bible, the God of peace. And it says, you know, remember uh, Philippians 4, where he says that, uh, you know, meditate on these things, whatever is true. I like that word true today. Whatever is, is peaceful, whatever is right. You know, meditate upon these things. It says, and, 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 and do what you've learned, and the God of peace will be with you. There's a lot of people who aren't at peace because they're not aligned with the things of God. They're not meditating on godly things. You know how many people meditate on revenge? Sometimes people uh, meditate on fantasy revenge. It's like it's not even real people that they want to seek revenge. I don't, you know, it's just some really weird things that people give their mind over to. Sometimes people are, are meditating on lustful things. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're meditating, they're creating situations in their own mind, and that's bringing up emotions. That it's not even based on anything that ever really happened, or maybe it did really happen. And so these are the kinds of things that, and what happens, that's what's filling the soul. That's what's bringing the soul to a bad place. I don't know about you, I want my soul in a good place. As a matter of fact, sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I have bad thoughts. I have bad thoughts about people, life, situations, but I've made war on those thoughts. I have, I've, I've made a decision that whenever one of those thoughts gets into my mind, I'm going to get right into the Word of God. I'm going to rebuke the thought. I'm going to handle that thought. I'm going to handle that situation. And, and, I'm gonna, you know, and, and I, I go to God. and not like brute force. I'll just do it. I'm like, Lord, you've got to do something about this. I'm going to do my part. You do your part. And, and I know tomorrow is going to be a better place. When I say, you know, uh, instead of saying, I won't ever do it again, I think I, I mentioned that recently. You say, just say, I'll do better. But don't use I'll do better as an excuse for doing bad. You know, don't, not like I'm going to get into that and then I'll tell God I'll do better. But really do better. Do what you've learned. I, I think that's one of the biggest things that we can do as believers. Do, do what you've learned. Do, do what you've learned in the word of God. That's what uh, I think it's First Thessalonians 5. No, it was Philippians 4. It says, you know, you do these things that you learn them and, and the God of peace will be with you. That's a promise from the Lord. He's going to be with you. The second point, so we did one and three, um, was uh, reaping without sowing works towards death and not life. And I want to spend some time on that today. So we, we were looking at, at uh, Lot. We're going to look at Lot again today. We're going to spend some time drilling down a little bit deeper into the character flaws. Michelle, you did character last week. Character flaws or soul flaws that Lot had in his life that, that, that kept him from actually entering into the blessings of Abraham. <laughs> As like, you think about it, I'm like, I, I'm, anybody captivated by that since Sunday? It just looks like he could have been blessed. He, he could have done so much more. He could have been something, he could have been something amazing. You know, but, um, but he had some flaws that were, were in him. And one of the things was that he was drawing upon an anointing that wasn't his, and then he was not giving anything back to it. He was building his own kingdom, and that becomes very significant in what we're going to go through tonight. He, he was building his own. Uh, apart from uh, that which God had ordained, he was building his own, trying to do it his own way, trying to get his own. In a sense, he, he became a rival. Think about that. He became a rival of Abraham. Right? I mean, their flocks weren't getting, their, their, their herdsmen weren't getting along, and all these things, and, and, and to a place where his father figure, Abraham, says, you go that way, or you go some way, I'm going to go another way. I don't care where you go, I'm going to go the other side. And a lot of times when, when, when that story is being preached, you know, you might hear it, and it's like, you know, hey, you know, you, uh, you, you Abraham, and you got to get rid of your lots, you know, that, that kind of a thing. And, and, and today I want to flip that over. Maybe your lot. <laughs> you know, maybe your soul not not quite right. Maybe it is right, and, and so you can walk to the other side of that. But to look at it differently, and say, you know what, I'm 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 young. I'm immature. I'm not yet arrived. I'm not yet fully attained. But I'm pressing on for something better. What can I do better so that I don't become the lot that's in in, in the Bible? 
but I become like one of those 318 servants that became warriors that went out and, and rescued Lot. Those who actually functioned under the anointing of Abraham. So what happened? These, some of these are recaps, but uh, first of all, Lot did not honor Abraham. Right? He, he didn't honor Abraham. He made soulish, selfish decisions. He chose the, the, the better plan, whatever was good to the eyes. He had the lust of the eyes. He saw the plains of Jordan, the well watered uh, with the cities and, and all of that. And he said, I'm going to take that side over there. I don't care how wicked Sodom and Gomorrah are. I'm going to take that. He made very uh, soulish uh, deci- decisions. You would think that if you were coming up as a, a underling, a son, that you would have given preference to the patriarch. But now he, he, Abraham said, you choose. He said, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the best part. I think about that. So that's, that's part of what this, the, our, our up-and-coming generations are really messed up that way. You know, they want first. They want the choicest part. If they can't get it, there's going to be a fit. If they're going to be triggered, you know. I don't get what I want the way I want it, and this and that. Then that's abuse today. That's not right. That's not right. They're not going to survive well that way. He lived uh, in comprom- compromised convictions, dwelling in the cities of the plain where the men were notoriously wicked and sinful. Yet you think to the, even to the point where he offered up his daughters to the men of the city. You know, some, some people say, you know, they, they read to us, oh, he didn't really mean that. He's being sarcastic. No, read the word. He really meant it. And warning his family to leave the city. They laughed at him. He said, we've got to get out of here. God's going to destroy this thing. And they laughed at him. They didn't take him seriously. He lacked credibility. I wonder what he did in his life or how he was living that he lacked credibility. His offspring being corrupt. The ancestral relationship that, that his daughters had with him. You know, it's, it's one of the things where, and I heard, it, I heard it phrased this way one time, rather than giving birth to solutions, he gave birth to problems. <laughs> and, and that, you know, it's, it, and so you know, the, the soul issues, if they're not dealt with, they reproduce generation to generation. I, you know, we, we, hear, we hear a lot about Lot's wife. We're going to read about that in a minute. But, I mean, obviously she wasn't a godly woman. I don't know what he saw in her. She must have been hot. And if that's all he was after, because we see he had the lust of the eyes. He wanted a trophy wife. If you reap without sowing, you're working towards death and not life. But if you continue to sow while reaping, you're working from death to life. And I think if we can get that, let me repeat that for you. If, you. if you continue to sow while reaping, you are working from death to life. So this, this is what we end up with in life. I've worked hard. I deserve this. I've been working for this for a long time. Now, this is, this is mine. A lot of times, this is where we get to in the world. Because people tell you, too, you deserve it. You've, you've, you've worked so hard for this. You, you, have, you have done great things. But we as believers ought to give glory to God. I said, yeah, I have really been blessed. God has, has blessed me with a determination and a work and a drive. And now here comes the time of, of, of my blessing. And when that happens, what is our response? There's got to be a response to that. And if the response is, oh, I'm going to get me the, the biggest bride. I'm, 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 I'm going to upgrade the house. I'm going I'm, I'm to get all the clothes, all the stuff that I've ever wanted. I'm going I'm to go out and get the girl. I'm going to go out and get the guy. I'm gonna go, all these different things. Is, is, is that where our mindset is as believers? Maybe. But not for mature believers. Mature believers go to a different place altogether. But sometimes God will work on your heart and say, I, I, want, I want you to sow into something else, right? You think about that. <clears throat> the life of, no, it's mine. I've been holding off. I'm afraid if I give it up, I'm going to go right back to the same place that I was. And, but if you keep sowing as you're reaping, then you're actually working from death to life. You're actually becoming transformed. You're becoming new. You're becoming more and more like Jesus and less and less like Lot. That you're, you're, and and not, not I'm giving to get, but I'm, I'm giving because that's the nature of God 
working within me. Remember, God so loved the world that he gave his son. Jesus gave his life. And, and so the, Jesus came as a servant. And even uh, right up to the time of the cross, he was still forgiving. He's on the cross forgiving. And, or forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. This day you will be with me in paradise. He's on the cross and still ministering. See, when you're going through a hard time and you're nailed to your proverbial cross, are you still ministering at that time? Are you still looking outside and beyond yourself? 1 John 3, starting in verse 11. You can turn there if you want, or I can just read it. 1 John 3, he writes, uh, For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. That's a powerful statement. He's saying right off, we, you've heard this from the beginning. This, is, this was always. The Old Testament, New Testament, this was always. Love, love your brothers. The message of love has always been there. But he said, not like Cain. Cain murdered his brother because his brother did good work. He murdered him for his righteousness. Isn't that a, a precursor to Christ? But I think sometimes as believers, we can get mad at other people because they're doing well, because they're doing good, because they're doing better than what we feel like we are. And sometimes that's just a feeling. It's got nothing to do with anything. It's just how we feel. So we don't, uh, maybe we don't physically murder them. <laughs> might murder them in our mind. Might, might uh, murder their reputation. But the, the message here is love. Verse 13, he says, I uh, don't marvel. Um, do not marvel, my brethren, even if the world hates you. Just like in the case with Cain and Abel. When you do well, some people are still going to hate you. Verse 14 says, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. So this, this message of love, this is how you're giving back. Think about it. This, this, this is so much more beyond the financial reaping and sowing. This is sowing love because you've received love. And that's how you know that you've changed. That's how you know you've passed from death to life because you love others with the love of Jesus the same way he loved you. In fact, if you want to put it in a lot situation, Lot would have loved others because Abraham had loved him. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. In the context of the, of, of the message... We're in the position of Lot to the kingdom of God. As Lot was relationally to Abraham, we are to the kingdom of God. Now, now watch where I'm going with this. The kingdom, the kingdom of God is our Abrahamic leader. Think about this. Because the same way, remember, Lot was not Abraham's son. But he was by adoption. It was his nephew. He inherited a relationship, however it happened. But when, when, when Abraham left up out of the, the Chaldeans, he, he took Lot with him. So he wasn't counted amongst the servants. Matter of fact, he was building an inheritance. He came as a son. He was, he was grafted in. He, he was there by adoption. And so that's how we are with the kingdom of God. Romans 8.14, I'll read it to you. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Remember that teaching on Abba, Father. That, God, that, that Jesus gave us his relationship with the Father. Nobody can call him Abba but Jesus but he's extended that to us as believers to have that same crying out relationship with the Father that he has. Verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the, the children of God. So there's something there that's taking place. The Spirit bears witness to it. And what is the Spirit bearing witness to? Tie it back. The Spirit bears witness to the love that's in our hearts. 
the Spirit bears witness of the love that we have one for another. So that's where the shift comes in. How do you know that you're new? How do you know you're his? How will they know that we are Jesus' disciples? They'll know you're my disciples by your love for one another. That there's a well that's flowing. It's something different, a shift that's taking place. And I believe God's really doing a work here. Man, if we could just recognize the places where we lack and, and, and get to the Father and allow him to fill in the spaces, to fill in the gaps, how different can we be? Anybody who said the kingdom of God is our Abraham? God, for the sake of illustration, God is our Abraham. So how do we relate to him? How do we relate to his wealth, his inheritance? Is it going to be like Lot did? Or are we going to do it like Jesus? I think we need to look at how Jesus does it. This, this is something I think is amazing. Adoption. Adoption is a two-way street. Think about that. It's a two-way street. So, so by the Spirit of God, he has adopted us and made us sons and daughters. But likewise, we need to adopt the Father as, as our Creator. As our God, as our Lord, we have to be grafted into the kingdom of God. We have to be able to receive it and to understand it that way. Me just saying, I'm your father, does not make me your father. Unless you're going to receive me as your father. I mean, I'd still be your father, but I could still be your father, but it's going to be the most dysfunctional relationship and, and, and one of the most um, impossible. You can only go but so far. Very limited, not impossible, very limited and what that relationship can do. But if I turn now and I say, I receive you as father. You know, sometimes, let me see if I can back it up a little bit. You can be a friend to somebody who doesn't want to be your friend. Right? You ever, ever reach out like a friend to somebody and they're like, I don't care about you? You ever call people that don't call you back? You ever text people that never text you back? You ever try to, like, invite people, but they never answer the invitation? It's kind of like that. It's a two-way street. Now, that relationship can only benefit, but so far. What happens when you call people who never call you back, text them, never text you back, invite them, and they never answer? What happens? Why do you stop? Because you're aggravated. It's aggravating. You know what happens, too? Somebody else will answer. So your attention, your focus goes that way. Your rewards are going that way. And that's how it is with the Father. What did God ask of us that we would believe? That, that's, just believe. All right, get it in the head. That's one level of belief. That's 30-fold. <laughs> get it in the heart, 60-fold. Get it in the spirit, it's 100-fold. To be able to, as, it, as it's dropping down and, 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 and getting into the fullness of your being, then you're shifting, you're changing, you're becoming new. Your words, your actions, your thoughts, your reactions become new. Becoming something more than, than what you were before. Let's look at uh, Lot's soulish character flaws. And watch how they, they continue to be revealed. You, you want to follow along in the Word, we're going to spend a little time in uh, chapter 19 of Genesis. Let's go Genesis 19, starting in verse 14. Now, let's start in 12. So the two angels are... Approaching Sodom, picks up verse 12. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you might have in the city? Take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Those are some strong words. Could you imagine that? An angel shows up at your house and says, Kim! You got to get out of Havel now. Take it. Get your family. Get your friends. Get everybody you can and get out of the city. We're going to blow this place. We're going to take this whole city out. 
So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law, uh, who had married his daughters, and said, uh, Get up and get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But his sons-in-laws, uh, to, to them, he seemed to be joking. They thought he was funny. I, I think that's, that, I, I know I already talked about it, but that's, that's a huge flaw. They can't tell when you are dire, serious, and when you're joking around. So when the, the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, uh, saying, Arise and take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. That's, that's something. Um, there, there's a time to, to, to separate. There's a time, time to, to part company from the ungodly. And God will tell you at certain times, it's time for you to get up and, and, and move out. It's time for you to move on from the place where you are. It's time for you to move, move out from some of the company that you're keeping because uh, destruction is coming this way. It's, it's, it's a warning that's there. And I think it's a place where a lot of uh, new believers fail miserably. They don't know when it's time to get up and move out. They don't know when it's time to, to break one circle and to move into another circle. And so what happens is, and here he's saying, look, the city's going down one way or another. You might as well get out of here. And I think sometimes we get caught up in the punishment of the ungodly because we refuse to part ways. Now, sometimes you've got to put distance between your old friends. What's that? Oh, yeah, that's... Yeah, listen to what Belinda's saying right there because I kind of moved past that moment. It was good, though. Yeah, sometimes you need to put distance between you and your old friends, between family members that are a hindrance to your spiritual growth. Ugh. You ever have friends that were a hindrance to your spiritual growth? <laughs> yeah. I'm still convinced that's why I had to leave Brockton to go to the Cayman Islands to get saved because I was definitely in the council of the ungodly. Um, and so, I, I mean, I thank God for it. I mean, I'm not going to argue with him. I don't know if he could have done it better, but I think the results were worth it. Arise, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And verse 16, while he lingered, just think about that. <laughs> he lingered? Really? Get up out of here. Get everybody. Get out of here and all that. And he's like, well, uh, right after the next episode of Friends, he was just hanging out. He was lingering. And so while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand his wife's hand in the hands of his two daughters and the Lord being merciful to him. Uh, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. So the angels just grabbed them by the arms, dragged him out of the city. And so it came to pass uh, when he had brought them outside that he said, escape for your life. There's the angels yelling at you. Escape here. Run! Don't look behind you nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. <laughs> then the lot said to them please no my lords <laughs> They're like run you're going to we're going to kill everything destroy everything he said no please indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight and you have increased your mercy and you have shown uh, me by saving my life but i cannot escape to the mountains lest some evil overtake me and i die See now that this city is near enough for me to flee to. And it's just a little one, just a little city. And not a big city, it's just a little one. He said, uh, please, let me escape there. Is it not a little one? Let me escape there and my soul shall live. Bargaining. He, he, he's bargaining. He said, I know you're going to destroy the whole plane, but there's a little city over there. Just a little bit of my past life. Just, just, a, just a little, just a little something to remember uh, 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 Sodom by. Can, can I just have a little bit of the inheritance that I was going to get before? Just think about. It. He wasn't looking for safety. He was just looking for relief. He wasn't looking to be free. 
He, he, he was still, he even, he even said it. He said, if, if, let me escape there and my soul shall live. He's still trying to feed his flesh. He's still trying to get it in there. And he said to him, uh, see, I have favored you concerning this thing. Also, that I will not overthrow the city to which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything. Watch this one here. I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zor. Now, he says, uh, uh, I can't do anything. I can't, I can't destroy this place until you arrive there. Now, this is what uh, I think a lot of us need to, to recognize. You remember um, talking about bargaining. Remember Abraham was bargaining to save Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that? Uh, if, if, if there's 50 righteous men there, would you still destroy the city? Uh, he said, well, no, I wouldn't do it if there's 50. Well, Abraham, no, that wasn't a great deal, not for that city. They said, how about 50 minus 5? How about 30? Got them all the way down to 10. And they went and they inspected, the, and, and they couldn't find 10 righteous. At best, they found Lot. But he said, I won't destroy it yet until you're clear, until you're out of there. And, and, and you think that there's a lot of things that people will take as God's favor in their life, and the only reason why that thing is still holding there, it's still existing, it's still holding on, is for your sake, because God doesn't want to destroy you. I, I can tell you, uh, prior to ministry, of all the companies that I worked for that prospered, 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 prospered until I left that company and it closed up six months later or a year later or immediately upon my exit. And how many times I turn around and say, man, I guess I was carrying that whole ship, wasn't I? You know, just, just in there. And in a sense, God's favor was there as long as I was there. But there was always a conflict with my Christianity. Not with the Christianity, I'd say, but with my morality that would cause me to leave that to go to something else. I won't lie about that. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to support this move. I'm not going to support this project. This, this is contrary to my Christian belief system. I can't do that. And, and after a while, it's like, look, you're just going to keep pushing the line. It's time for me to move on. And then you watch it collapse behind you. you realize, how, many, how many different things in your life are being sustained while God is waiting for you to move up out of the place where you are to the place where you're supposed to go? Verse 23, the sun had risen on the earth when Lot entered Zor. And the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. So he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But his wife, Lot's wife, looked back behind him and she became a... Pillar of salt. Great scripture. It's like, you know, kids' church, one-on-one, we learn about Lot's wife, and they always, like, <laughs> they always put in a picture like she just turned into a statue. You know. Literally, if, if you look at it and you read it literal, literally, it's a pile of salt. She just became a pile of, of salt on the ground. You look at the Hebrew word for it, um, it's actually like a military position. It can represent a military position or something that is immovable. When she looked back at the old life, she became something that is uh, stubborn and immovable. So you can look at what is this Lot's wife thing. Carrying something along behind that cannot and will not agree with God becomes an anchor, becomes something that is stuck and immovable. There is no way she could continue on the journey with him. So very specifically, do not look back. Flee. Do not look back. Defiance turns and looks back. Longingly looking back. Constantly looking back. And sometimes, if, if, if you've got pillars of salt in your circle, stop trying to change that circle. 
to change your circle. It's time to move on to something else. It's time to move on. It's, it's time to leave that, that, that pile of salt behind and move into the things that God has for you. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land and the plain. And, and he saw and behold the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst uh, of the overthrow. And he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Very important piece to get there. So in the midst of all this, God says, I'm going to wreck it. I'm going to destroy it. Um, and, and, and Abraham bargained with him, and, 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 and he met Abraham's bargain, but the city still couldn't live up to it. So, all right, here comes the fire and the brimstone, and, and I'm going to wreck it. said, every living thing was ruined. Everything's gone. But Lot was preserved because God remembered Abraham. Now, how does that come back together for circles? <laughs> Y'all need an Abraham in your circle. A Abraham, uh, uh, an, an intercession. Abraham, a, a, a mature, called, anointed one with a relationship with God that covers circles. Think about it. Y'all need Abraham in your, in, your, in your circle. And so, just remember, and, and it was because of the intercession of Abraham. It was because God remembered Abraham. Matter of fact, Abraham didn't pray specifically for Lot. He just prayed for one righteous one in the city. Lot had opportunity. I was, after when, when Abraham, or when Lot escaped to Zor, Abraham stood up on a mountain and over, oversaw the plain and everything that took place. Lot still had another chance. <laughs> the bus hadn't left yet. Abraham was still in the neighborhood. Just think about that. But he failed time and time again. He failed to be grafted into Abraham's blessing, the true blessing, the true anointing. He, he never caught on to uh, the, the nature of the man who pursued God. And so pretty much, I mean, that's pretty much the end of Lot. Well, we're connected to the kingdom. We're grafted in by the spirit of adoption. We said that, that because of the Holy Spirit bears witness that we're grafted in. And when we came into the kingdom of God, we were probably all as ignorant as Lot. <laughs> we, came, we knew nothing. When you got saved, the day you got saved, what you knew was you said the prayer, and, and you invited Jesus to come into your heart. Your character was probably pretty much still the same when you went to bed that night. Your mind hadn't yet changed or been renewed. Maybe you're thinking a little bit differently or, or thinking about change or, or thinking about turning some things around, but you still had that kind of worldly character, that worldly je ne sais quoi. That's French for I don't know what. But remember what um, the Apostle Peter said. He called Lot righteous. Second Peter 2 6 says God uh, turning the cities of, God, of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to, to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live God uh, would live ungodly. Let me just repeat that to get it right context. God turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. When people say, I don't know why God destroyed the cities. He didn't have to do that. They say, well, it was an example for those who would live ungodly. And, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Isn't that interesting? Now, now, so so watch, watch what happened here. Because, uh, well, he wasn't, he wasn't a righteous man. He wasn't living righteously. But it talks about righteous lot, talking about a, a righteous soul. It means, in other words, there was different characteristics of his soul. It's like he, he could look at it and know this is bad. He could look at it and say, this, this hurts my heart to see all of this. But yet he did not depart from it. That's a character flaw. 
He continued to look. He torment, it says here he tormented his own soul. <laughs> tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their law, lawless deeds. We're called to be different. That's why I went home today and changed my T-shirt so I could put on my distinct T-shirt. Because we're different, we're distinct, we're different in the earth. And we're called to do things differently from, from what we once did. So just remember that about, you know, about we were once a lot. We might still be a lot. <laughs> well, thank God we have time. When we come into the kingdom of God, we're probably just as ignorant as Lot. But by grace, by belief, by discipleship, we can change and we can grow. We can change and we can grow. I think that's, that's, I think that's important. As disciples and, and, and what we're talking about here, there's times where we're going to be having fellowship with people who are having a very, very difficult time uh, uh, changing, uh, uh, transfer, transforming, maybe stuck in, 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 in their old nature and not yet ready to move out into the new nature or they don't have the faith to do it. We say, you know, by discipleship, by God's grace, by his mercy, by engagement, by inviting the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, spending time in the Holy Ghost, that, that there's an opportunity for you to become something new and to change. That's, that's what happened with me. That's what happened with Michelle. That's what happened with a lot of people here in the room. That, that you know, your, 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 your soulish self, your soul, your soul was, was on, on the scale of, of zero being bad and, and 100 being good. You're right around like 30%. But over time, you're, you're creeping up. You're, you're, moving, you're moving forward. You're, you're advancing. You're, you're, you're taking new ground. You're becoming something new, I hope. Only two judges can actually give you a definitive answer on it, you and God. And chances are you're wrong. But you know a tree by its fruit. Good trees don't put out bad fruit. Bad trees don't put out good fruit. It is what it is. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Pay attention to what's coming out of your mouth. Not when you plan it to come out. What comes out when you aren't planning for it to come out. Then what comes out. That's, that's what I want. Sometimes, don't you surprise yourself sometimes by the stuff that comes out of your mouth? Sometimes good. That's a nice surprise. Sometimes no, so that was not a good surprise. I, was, I, I thought I had dealt with that. I thought that was over with. Now, a refusal, to, a refusal to grow is a commitment to the status quo. A refusal to grow means that you're satisfied where you are, that you, you, you're not going to go uh, any further. I've determined that, that good enough is good enough. I, I've, I've decided that uh, I decided I want to be standard. No, I, I decided I want to be fair. <laughs> I want, you know what? Uh, uh, what? What kind of a man? What kind of man is Nick? Uh, he's better than average. How would you rate his walk with the Lord? Uh, just above standard. He's right on the mark. That's not where we want to be. Uh, Paul said, "I've not yet attained." I've, I've, I've not yet attained. I'm not already perfected. But what? But I press on. But I, I, I go forward. I go for, I go for more. I, I know that the perfection lies ahead. So I leave the former things behind. I, I go forward. I, I, I reach forward to lay hold of that for which he laid hold of me and to recognize that I'm made for something more than, than where I am right now. There's an advancement. So a refusal to do that means uh, I, I just want to be status quo. I just, want to be, I just want to be an ordinary Christian. Never heard of such a thing. I just want to be ordinary. A rejection of the blessing, the engagement, the inheritance associated with sonship. When you say, uh, this is far enough, I don't want to grow anymore, you're rejecting the blessings of sonship. You are exactly a lot, if that's the case. Remember, Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren. From our earthly perspective, he is to be the firstborn of many brethren. From the heavenly perspective, he is the firstborn of, of, of many brethren. Now, he went first. He's gone through perfection. 
right? He is, he's glorified. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and so we are, are looking ahead to, 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 to take our place in the kingdom that way. We want to become like the, the sons and the servants that, that, that are aligned right with the kingdom of God, not the wayward ones, not, not, the, not the ones that are out there feeding the, the, the pods to the pigs. But we want to be the ones that return to the Father, the ones that are grafted in, the ones who, who, who have uh, uh, come into the, the commitment of, a, of, a, of adoption. Remember the, 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 the parable of the talents. Remember the one had five, you know, uh, one had uh, uh, four, uh, one had one, and, 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 and I'm sorry, one had five, one had two, and one had one, and, and what was the end of the math with those? A one ended up with 11. <laughs> one ended up with four, and one ended up with, Zero. Nothing. Don't be a zero. Don't be a zero. That, that's our new expression. When somebody's not trying to grow, not trying to do any better, say, don't be a zero. Be a four. Be an 11. Go for more. Remember the, the, uh, uh, the, the parable of the soil? You had that wayside soil, rocky soil, thorny soil, and good soil. Are you satisfied with thorny soil, rocky soil, or are you ready to be good soil, ready to produce some tomatoes and some cucumbers and some habanero peppers? The same principle is applied to the local church, to other circles, to other uh, ministerial bodies. We, many of us serve in many different circles. We we exist in many different circles, but are you are you uh, wanting to grow in these circles? Are you wanting to advance? Are you looking to get into a, a stronger circle, a better circle? Are, are you satisfied to just kind of go around that track or around the mountain? We always say, you know, it's okay to go around the mountain. Just make sure you're, you're moving up the mountain as you're going around, right? Not around, up. I don't want to come back around to the same place. So haven't we been here before? I don't want to do that. Or... <laughs> Gee, we didn't pass this a long time ago. It looked like we were going down the mountain. Trying to go up and trying to get to the next thing. Trying to get to the place where God has called me to. To realize and bring that into every aspect of our lives. You know, your household is a circle. Your family is a circle. Your church is a circle. Your job is a circle. Your community is a circle. Those whom you have relationships with, those are circles. And you know what? I don't want to just hop from one circle to another one. I want to better the circle that I'm in. Brings us all the way back around, if you think about it, that as I am reaping, I'm sowing. As, I, as I'm increasing, I'm increasing my circle. I'm investing back into my circle. The more, the more I receive, the more I give. That there's a, a, a give and a take, that there's a, a, a rhythm, a heartbeat. There, there, there's, there's that something more that, that, that pulls us together, and we're united together by the Spirit of God. So there's a danger in not progressing. Hebrews 5, let me just read it to you. 13, you know this one. Everybody who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is obeyed. But solid food, good food, belongs strong meat belongs to those who are of full age. That is, are those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the, the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection or go on to maturity, not laying again the foundations of repentance and uh, repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, that there's something that, to, to advance forward. As, as it goes forward from there, it, it begins to talk about falling away from from the Lord, falling away from the things of God. And, and you know, to summarize it, I, this is my quote. I'm just putting it down like this. Those who don't grow fall into the danger of falling away. God has not called us to be stagnant, to be uh, stable, to be standard, but he's called us to grow. It's an old quote. Where is it? Did I bring it out? I wonder if I brought it out. I didn't bring it out. We'll save that for next week then. I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> but how, anybody remember how it goes? Uh, living things grow, healthy things. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it next week. But um, grow, advance. Don't be like Lot. Get your place. Go after the things of God. Hold strong.
I learned how to hold the microphone right. <clears throat> so when you when I it's it's I talked to you on Sunday, Pastor, about how amazing it is that we're going over uh, this part of Genesis, and I'm actually studying Genesis at home. This part of Genesis at home, and today my reading was on exactly what you're talking about today. And something that I learned was that, um, well, in the past I've had trouble showing mercy to people who disappoint me or displease me or offend me in some way. I've always had trouble with that, and I'm getting better, praise God. But I, I'm it's something that I'm that I that I've struggled with. So um, in the reading today, I learned that God had God extended so much mercy to, to to Abraham, Sarah, and Lot, all three of them, um, but especially Lot. And although Lot was the way he was, uh, God still had mercy, still showed mercy toward Lot because of the the righteous man in his life, because of Abraham. Um, and that taught me to think about. Um, how I treat other people who offend me um, from a different perspective. So if someone offends me and I'm having trouble showing them mercy, I should think about the righteous person in their life. And maybe I should for, maybe I should think about, maybe there's a mother who's praying for that person. Maybe there's a cousin, a relative, somebody in that person's life who loves that person who all who is also aware of that person's flaws and is praying every day for that person to change instead of me hating on that person or being upset with that person and trying to you know hold their flaws against them maybe I should join that righteous person in prayer or maybe I could be that righteous person in that person's life um, and so it may not make too much sense but it made sense to me so like if, if God was able to forgive lot uh, or if God was able to show mercy to lot, despite everything Lot did and everything Lot was because of Abraham, because he loved Abraham, well, then I can show mercy to somebody who offends me just, you know, because God God did it. So why, you know, why why wouldn't I be able to do it? From what you're saying, one of the things, you look at, at Lot, you realize uh, Lot was allowed to make mistakes. God didn't wipe wipe him out for for making mistakes. He he didn't kill him. He didn't destroy him. And and the, the very definition of 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 mercy means not delivering a punishment that's deserved, right? So you you look you look right into this, and you realize you've got mercy. God has shown you mercy, and now your response is to show mercy to others and and to show love, um, and and love is praying for somebody. Love is coming alongside them. Sometimes love um, is is brutal. Sometimes love is fierce. The difference is it's for their benefit. So there's times when you'll correct people. There's times when you're, 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 you're going to speak the truth. It'll hurt their feelings. Or, but it's the truth that they need to hear. So it, it goes that ex- that's actually dwelling in the second mile, being able to do that in love. Because sometimes you'll do that. You might come down hard on somebody. Um, and at the same time, you might destroy them, but you'll also pick them back up. So you just, just to be able to be sensitive in those situations, I think, is important and to always know the motivation of the heart you know don't fly off the handle that's an immature thing to fly off the handle a mature thing says all right let's be cool let's 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 run it out and then to deal with things not just to pack them away but to 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 put it away for a moment and then come back for and deal with it uh, appropriately and so i think your your example is good the uh thing with lot was there were big consequences huge consequences for his mistakes but he was still allowed to make those mistakes. And so there's got to be that kind of wiggle room that's in there. It's good. What's that? Well, sometimes we can't because our soul is bad. Huh. Oh, he did not. Yes, he did. Anybody else? Thank you, Jufi. Anybody else? Praise the Lord. Father, we just give you glory. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. That God, that uh, I believe that we are advancing. We're taking ground. We're going into new places. Uh, that Lord, that you have certainly anointed the room and anointed those in the room to, to hear, to receive, to, uh, to speak, to, 
uh, to grow, to grow, to grow. Uh, grow I believe uh, growth is a command. I believe you're commanding us to, to, to step out and to move forward in the things uh, that you have for us. I pray, God, for opportunities to demonstrate, to activate what it is that we just walked through, what it is that we just learned. Uh, that uh, I believe that there's a, a, a new sight and a new vision to recognize that <laughs> we're not always Abraham, that sometimes we're, we're a lot. And so to, to give ourselves a break when we fail, to give others a break when we fail, but to be able to walk in the abundance and the blessing that you have for us. I pray, God, as we are growing by faith, as we are uh, walking by the Spirit, that we receive and we walk in the spirit of adoption, the grafting in, the work and the gift that you have given us by calling us your sons and your daughters. That, Lord, I believe that through it there is increase. And so we pray, God, give us the strength to keep going forward. I think of those that were in that vision, that were standing right on that precipice, and they need to hear what was said tonight. And more so, they need it activated in their lives. They need, they need people who are working with them to hold them uh, accountable and to keep them on the mountain and to uh, preserve them. We know it's your work that does the preservation, but you work through us. And so, Lord, uh, I said we submit ourselves to you. We open ourselves up to do your work. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our midst. And we pray, Lord God, that uh, let, let your uh, anointing continue to flow through this house and through this room and through this pulpit and through these teachings and through Sunday services and, and everything, Lord God, that we set our hands to, that you would bless us in this city and wherever it is that we go, I pray, increase our circles, God. Increase us with maturity. Increase us in power and in spirit. Increase us in number. Uh, increase us in effectiveness for the kingdom, the, the, king, the, the building of the kingdom of God. We thank you for what you're doing in our presence in our midst tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.